Good morning and welcome to the week six lecture video. Let's go ahead and take a look at the agenda for today and then we'll go ahead and pray. Okay, uh, once again, I recommend that you watch the worship video for the week. This is, uh, this is a great one. Uh, uh, from there, we're going to cover the results and the tables and figures today. So let's go ahead and, and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for giving us this day, this, this opportunity uh, to have life, to worship you through everything that we do today. Lord, we, we just pray that you uh, give us the, the strength to see through the world and to see you, to keep our eyes on you and to ask you every day, what do you want me to do? Why did you give me life today, Lord? Lord, as we wade into this material and uh, as we're getting close to finishing this class, we just ask uh, that you give us the wisdom to understand why you've put us here and, and how this material is related to the plan that you have for us. Lord, we, we dedicate this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so once again, there are three prongs to this course. The first prong being theory, which comes out of you reading the textbook, taking the quizzes, and us reviewing the quizzes. Uh, SPSS, you're all done with that. And finally, uh, today you're going to see how uh, you understanding uh, how to interpret stats is is important, right? Because uh, for your results section, you're going to be given one analysis for each of your hypotheses, and then you're going to have to interpret the analyses. Obviously, I'll help you if you get stuck. You can help each other in the reaction forms, the discussion boards. But yeah, that's the whole point of prong two. You can't do research without statistics. The next one is prong three, okay? The research paper. Well, that's the point of all the lectures, all the discussion forums and the other assignments. By other assignments, I mean rough drafts. Let's go ahead and start by going over quiz five. A mixed, methods, uh, mixed method describes what research technique, obtaining both qualitative and quantitative data. I think this is always a good idea. And a good example of this is if you look at personality and gay marriage attitudes, uh, there's, there's different uh, measurements of degree of uh, support for same-sex marriage. And then there's an opportunity for participants to explain their point of view. Okay, so the the Likert scale, okay, for support for same-sex marriage is quantitative data. Uh, how people voted on Prop 8 is quantitative data, right? The yes or no, the qualitative is that writing component. What is an advantage of semi-structured interviews over structured interviews? Researchers can adapt questions to pursue the most useful information. In an interview that's fully structured, you have a set of questions and you ask those questions, okay? And you usually don't deviate, right? And that's that's the word structured. Semi-structured, there is that freedom to maybe dig a li little deeper if a participant says something that you're interested in. How many participants are typically in a focus group? The answer is six to 12. That seems like a manageable number. Uh, it's possible to have too few people. It's possible to have too many. I think, in my opinion, too few is a lot better than too many. Uh, you'll probably get all these individuals to talk in the three to six group. But once you get to 12 to 24 or greater than 20, it's just, it's, it's too hard to manage. It'll take way too much time. 
Grounded theory researchers use open coding for what to establish themes for further analysis. Okay, we'll leave that at that. An external stability check of data in a CQR study includes which of the following, comparing interview data to other data. Which of the following is an advantage of case study research that enables close reading of social life? So a case study, right, is focusing, when I say focusing, I mean studying and describing one person or one group. And it could be, let's say, uh, uh, a case of autism or a case of schizophrenia uh, on the individual level. And, and uh, maybe it's a unique case. So the researcher would sit there and, and describe all the symptoms, all the actions, uh, et cetera, just to get a, a better understanding of how autism, how schizophrenia is expressing itself in that individual. Now, as far as a group, it could be a case study on, you know, the, the most successful company in the United States, maybe related to retention. So, so it would be a study of how is this company retaining their employees? Let's, let's really study it and try to describe the environment, et cetera. Okay. And again, it, it's not necessarily generalizable to other situations or other companies or other individuals with schizophrenia or other individuals with autism, but it just gives us a lot of rich data and helps us understand the phenomenon of interest. And again, it can be generalizable, but not necessarily. If a mixed methods design first collects qualitative data and then collects quantitative data, what is the name of the design type? That's called exploratory. And that's a great way to do it. You know, before you conduct a quantitative study, maybe uh, with various validated measures like self-esteem or religiosity, some of the ones we're using are the big five. Maybe you wanna, maybe you wanna understand what you're studying. You know, and you could do that by gathering qualitative data. So it, just interviewing people. Okay. Which of the following is a true experimental design? When again, I, I, for qualitative data, I said interviewing people, but it, I believe, you know, from the reading, you clearly realize this could include uh, observation. This could include case studies, which we just talked about, and the list goes on. Which of the following is a true experimental design? Uh, these are all true experimental designs. So read, um, read more about these in your text. If you have questions, talk to me about them. What can researchers use to overcome all threats to internal validity? A true experimental design. What is the name of the threat that warns researchers to be careful in gen generalizing the results to a population when an experiment is conducted on a non-random sample selection bias? Well, we've already talked about this. And you know, clearly, if you look at the participant section of, of personality and gay marriage attitudes, right, which is your study, and you wrote your participant section based on personality and gay marriage attitudes and the data I provided you, you'll see that there definitely is selection bias in personality and gay marriage attitudes. I've referred to it as, instead of a random sample, a convenient sample. And you can see that what the average age I believe is 19 years old. These are all college students. Um, there's, a, there's a high proportion of Asians. And, and all of this is not representative of the overall population let's say of where uh, Riverside County, LA County, San Bernardino County, or the state of California or, or the United States. So it's definitely not a, a, a random sampling. And you can, you can see that because uh, the, the racial breakdown, it, it doesn't match the state, uh, doesn't match the United States, doesn't match the county, the local counties. <clears throat> I'm not sure how gender is, but the age, is definitely 
really low is the average age in California 19? Probably not. I don't have an answer to that. But you can see uh, these are some things we've already talked about. Suppose a single random sample of workers in a factory is exposed to five different reward systems in succession, with each system being used for one month. What is the name of the threat that reminds researchers that the research results for the last reward system may not generalize to the population of workers? This is called multiple treatment interference. And it's, and it's exactly what it says. There are multiple treatments and they could be interfering with each other. Suppose an experimental classroom has research observers present at all times. Let me speak to that a little more. Okay. It would be something like this. If, if you have depression and we first give you uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and then psychoanalysis, and then we focus more on uh, pharmaceuticals, then we do some sort of Christian-based intervention. What's going on there? There's just so much going on that maybe w once we get to the Christian intervention, maybe all of the rest of the treatments beforehand um, either mess up the Christian intervention or uh, kind of get you to the point where the Christian intervention works better. But anyway, that, that's called interference, right? Because there's just so much going on. You're not sure what's actually healing the depression at that point. Suppose an experimental classroom has research observers present at all times. What is the name of the threat that reminds researchers that the results may not generalize to other classrooms without observers? A reactive effect of experimental setting. Well, I think this makes sense, right? observers present at all times may impact the attitudes and the behaviors of the students and the teacher in the classroom. I think we could all agree with that as compared to classrooms that do not have these observers. If a pretest causes a change in participant sensitivity to a treatment, what threat is operating? Reactive effect of testing. The key is that that pretest messes with the treatment. Whereas if this pretest doesn't exist, maybe the result would have been different. Which of the following factors is primarily responsible for limitations in identifying cause and effect relationships using pre experimental design? Uh, this is poor internal validity. Okay, so this is. This is quiz five. Go ahead and let me know if you have any questions about it. So I did, as promised, I gave you introduction, rough draft uh, feedback last week. So I gave that to you last Thursday and I put all that in the assignment comments for the introduction rough draft. Let me know if um, you cannot see them. The next round of feedback will be after this week because this week you're submitting your methods rough draft, which you should have already started to work on based on my email, as well as your results rough draft, okay? Which is really, we're gonna talk about that information today. So let's talk about the results. Okay, so it's pretty simple in that you each have three hypotheses, okay? Now we have to assess each of your hypotheses with one analysis. So you have three hypotheses, therefore you have three analyses. So I, this is just a, this is sample data. Where is it? Did I, oh, I shared the wrong thing. Give me one second. So this is, this is sample data from one of my previous classes and I'm going to get you your data by tomorrow afternoon, okay? 
So here's here's one of my students, right? So th this could be you. Okay, her first hypothesis was, it is hypothesized that race is related to degree of support for same-sex marriage. Okay, so that's her hypothesis. In order to assess this hypothesis, a one-way ANOVA needed to be conducted. So I did that. And I, I gave uh, this student all the data. So you have all the races, the sample sizes, the means, right? That's the important information. You have your F value and you have your P value. Okay, and then you have your multiple comparisons here. So just as we discussed in the SPSS lectures. I'll give you another one. This student had a hypothesis. It is hypothesized that those who identify as African-Americans tend to be higher in extrinsic religiosity than those who identify as Hispanic Latinos. So in order to assess this hypothesis, I conducted a independent samples uh, t-test, actually two independent samples t-tests for this student. So the first one's here. This is looking at intrinsic religiosity, uh, uh, or sorry, African-Americans and Hispanic Latinos compared on intrinsic religiosity. Here are the sample sizes and the means. Here is the T. So the T you're looking at is gonna be, where is it? Yeah, right here. So there's the T, the degrees of freedom. I'll zoom in a little. The T, the degrees of freedom, and the P value. Okay. And then the, the last type of analysis you're likely to see is the correlation. Hold on. So let me find one of those. Right. Okay. So this student had the hypothesis, individuals of higher religiosity, internal and external will tend to support same-sex marriage, less than individuals lower in religiosity. Okay. So here's our correlation matrix. Here's same-sex marriage correlated with intrinsic religiosity. So it's an R of negative 0.287, a p-value of very close to zero, so less than 0.05. Here's the correlation between same-sex marriage and extrinsic religiosity, R equals 0 0.02. Here's the p-value. Here's the correlation between intrinsic religiosity and extrinsic religiosity, R equals 0.39, P is less than 0.05, okay? So, so these are the data that, that you're going to get, okay? So depending on what your hypotheses are, you'll um, either get ANOVA, independent samples, t-test, and or correlation. Okay. So again, I'll, I'll be posting this on Canvas and emailing this to you tomorrow. Okay. So good. So at least you know what, what the data is going to look like. So what are you supposed to do with that? Okay. You have three hypotheses. You have one analysis per hypothesis. Therefore, in the results section of your paper, you need one paragraph per analysis. So you'll have three paragraphs in the results section of your paper. So what I've done, I've created templates for you to use. Obviously the SPSS activities that you did, uh, those are going to be a great resource. But these templates are basically taking that information and kind of putting it in a way that you can easily follow. So I'm in files, week six, week six, part one. And you'll notice I covered writing results templates. I covered ANOVA, I covered correlation, I covered independent samples t-test. So literally, you can open up this template, okay? And this is an example here. 
for you to follow. Okay. So it says an ANOVA indicated a significant difference somewhere among re religions on support for prayer in schools. F8 and 522 degrees of freedom, 21.57, P is less than 0.05. Do you see that? So there's your F. Oh, weird. Did I mess up the F? <laughs> the F should actually be 21.7. My bad. Okay. But so that's where you're going to get your F. I'll go ahead and fix that. And then, so that's your basic uh, ANOVA statement, your first statement. And then you say specifically Christians. And then you give the Christian mean 3.48. And you give the standard deviation sample size. It's all there. So Christian mean standard deviation and sample size. Support prayer in school significantly more than. And this is just a paired comparison. But again, watch the SPSS video. SPSS video to get a better understanding of how to use this. But essentially, when you're doing a paired comparison, you'll look at you'll look at uh, one of your values, so Christian, and it's Christians being compared to Catholic, Buddhist, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, agnostic, atheist, other. And if there's a star, it means there's a significant difference between Christian and Catholic on support for prayer in schools, right? Because that's the dependent variable. Christians and Buddhists, Christians and Hindus, Christians and Jewish people, Christian, uh, there's not a significant difference between Christians and Muslims. There's a significant difference between Christians and agnostics, Christians and atheists, Christians and other. And it comes down to the star that's telling you there's a significant difference. And again, how do you know so here it says specifically Christians support prayer in school more than, and then we list all these groups. Well, but how do you know if a group is um, higher than another group on the dependent variable or lower than the other group? Well, you just look at the, the means, right? So here we have the Christian mean is 3.48. So a higher number here means higher support for prayer in schools, okay? And literally, they're the highest. <laughs> so this one's kind of easy because everyone's low. All of these groups that are significantly different than Christians, they're all lower on support for prayer in schools. But, you know, depending on what your data is, that, that's not always going to be the case. Maybe some groups could be higher, some groups could be lower. But you identify that by looking at the means. Okay? So just follow this template. And again... You know, uh, part two, we're going to talk about doing tables and figures. At the at the end of your uh, result statement here, your result paragraph, you're going to have to say, see figure one for the relationship between gender and support for prayer in schools. We'll get into this more, but basically what this is, it's you're stating your result, okay? You're interpreting your result and you're pointing the reader to a figure or table that you've created. Let's look at the next one. So this is a correlation template. Okay. Again, so So the the last one, I guess I I didn't show a hypothesis, but looking at the data it's assumed that the hypothesis was uh, Christians tend to support prayer in schools more than all other religious affiliations. And it looks like that was mostly supported, um, except there was no significant difference between Christians and Muslims. In this one, based on past research, it is hypothesized that liberals will tend to support the legalization of medical marijuana more than conservatives. Okay. So political orientation and the legalization of 
medical marijuana. So I believe, I believe a a lower a lower number. So a lower number in political orientation is more liberal. And and I'll make sure to specify this when I give you your data, just to make sure you know the right direction to interpret. Okay. So, and there's a negative correlation. So that would mean uh, the lower your political orientation, the more liberal you are, the more you tend to support the legalization of marijuana. A correlation examined the relationship between political orientation and support for the legalization of medical marijuana. As predicted, there was a significant correlation. Okay, we're saying significant. Okay. And again, you're stating what you're trying to do here. A correlation examined the relationship between political orientation and support for the legalization of medical marijuana. And then you can either say as predicted or as not predicted, just based on the, the direction of, of your hypothesis. And then if it's significant, because P is less than 0.05, you use the word significant. If P is greater than 0.05, you say not significant. There was a significant correlation between political orientation and support for the legalization of medical marijuana. Okay, so there you see it. You put you put your R in, so R, and then you put your N, so N, which is 507, okay? You put your correlation, negative 0.17, and then that's your P-value, so 0 0.000. So just say here, P is less than 0 0.001, because P is never going to be zero. Okay, so you state that and then you interpret the correlation further by saying such that liberals tend to support the legalization of medical marijuana more than conservatives. So again, this is your this is your result statement. And as you'll see, and, and I'll go ahead and add it to this template. You're you're going to want to have a statement at the end that points people to your table. So you're gonna have a correlation table. So it'd be like like the last example, but it would say, for example, see table one for the relationship between political orientation and the support for the legalization of marijuana. And again, it's very logical. Okay, you're interpreting it here in words, and then that statement at the end is going to point them to the to the correlation table that you're going to make. There's a couple of examples here as well. The last one is the independent samples t-test. The hypothesis here is based on past research. It is hypothesized that females tend to support pran school, school more than males. Okay, here's your T. Okay, negative 2.19. Your P is 0 0.02 or 0 0.03. So P is less than 0 0.05. Okay, so it's saying there's a significant difference between males and females on prayer in schools. Uh, males are 2.5, females are 2.77. Therefore, females tend to significantly support prayer in schools more than males. So again, you're stating the analysis that you're doing. An independent samples t-test was conducted to examine the relationship between gender and support for prayer in schools. Females tended to support prayer in schools. And then you give their mean standard deviation and N, which is all right here. More than males, you give your T, all that information we just covered there. And here, see figure one for the relationship between gender and support for prayer in schools. Okay, so these are your templates. Let's go ahead and take a look at the, okay, the week six part one discussion. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Okay, once again, copy and paste your hypotheses. It's important because these hypotheses are related, okay? 
Uh, remember, you have three hypotheses. Oh, so write the results section of your paper. Be sure to watch this video before you begin. Remember, you have three hypotheses and one analysis per hypothesis. Therefore, you have a total of three analysis, and you need one paragraph. You need a one paragraph interpretation for each analysis. Therefore, you need a total of three paragraphs. Follow the relevant templates to construct your three paragraphs. And we covered all these templates. Then respond to two other students. Compare what they wrote to what you learned in the week six lecture video, as well as relevant templates above. Also, please let them know if something's unclear and if possible, suggest a correction. Okay, so pretty straightforward there. Let's talk about part two, so tables and figures. Okay, so remember, you have three, you have three analyses, right? Okay, so <laughs> three hypotheses, one analysis per hypothesis, you have three analysis total. In your results section, you need one paragraph per analysis. Therefore, you have three paragraphs in your results section. After each of those paragraphs, as I demonstrated to you, you're going to have to point to either a table or a figure. So let's go ahead and look at some templates. So week six folder under files, week six, part two, tables and figures, figure examples. Here, let me go ahead and download this. I think it'll look better. Okay, so here's a correlation example. Okay, so here's what you would put at the, if you have a correlation, here's what you would put at the end of your correlation paragraph. See table one for descriptive statistics and correlations among age, gender, and self-esteem. So depending on what you're doing. In this case, we're looking at the relationship between age, gender, and self-esteem. This is the template you're gonna follow, okay? Literally, literally copy and paste this template and modify it, okay? And you'll notice it looks exactly like SPSS. So here, here's the SPSS output, and you literally just take all this information and put it in your table. So I try to give you templates so it's a little easier. If you're doing an independent samples t-test, you're going to do a figure instead of a table. So a figure is basically a chart, whereas a table is a table. <laughs> I don't know what else to call it. And again, this is a statement you would put at the end of your, your independent samples t-test paragraph. See figure one for the relationship. Yeah, I would say see figure one for the relationship between gender and self-esteem. I guess you could write it like that because it's literally called relationship between gender and self-esteem. See figure one for relationship between gender and self-esteem. Okay, and you would do this graph. I'll show you, I've included an Excel file. So you can literally uh, download that Excel file, change your, your independent uh, variable levels, change your dependent variable, and then put in your means and it will generate this for you. So it's actually really not too hard to do. And here's your information. All you're doing here is you're graphing these means, right? So the mean for male is 3.17, the mean for female is 3.17. And then your ANOVA example, uh, C table two for ANOVA on <clears throat> ethnicity with regards to self-esteem. So, 
you can do a table like this. Essentially what you're doing is you're replicating the source table. Okay. So this is what you're going to do if there is no significant difference, meaning you do not have to look at paired comparisons. Because remember, if you're doing a one-way ANOVA and there's no significant difference, then you're, you're done here. If there is a significant difference, you can do you can do this. This is optional, but you have to do this. And essentially, you're you're going to be replicating, okay, this multiple comparisons chart. Okay, so you're going to make it look <clears throat> very similar. Actually, I take it back because <laughs> it's like, so you, you could do this. Let's just say you could do this, but I actually prefer, and that's why I put this note here. And I totally forgot. I prefer you do the figure. This actually looks a lot cleaner. So you, although you could do this, <laughs> don't do this. Okay. So let's do this again. So if your ANOVA is significant, you can do this. If your ANOVA is not significant, you have to do this one. If your ANOVA is significant, you have to do this one. Okay, just so you can show the differences between races on self-esteem in this case. And here, let me show you that template. What else do I have here? I have some other stuff, but we're not we're not doing factorial ANOVA. Here, let's take a look at the Excel file. So the Excel file is in the same place. Files, week six, week six, part two. So that's opening right now. Let's give it a second. Okay, here's, so literally download the Excel file and you're good to go. You, you can just double click here to change uh, the independent variable, to change the levels, to change the dependent variable. And then you could just, you know, whatever your means are, you could change them. And then you could just copy and paste this in. Same thing for ANOVA, okay? So I tried to give you these templates to make this whole process a lot easier. Okay, let's look at the week six, part two discussion assignment. Okay, once again, copy and paste your hypotheses. As you can see, these are very important. State one finding from your results section and create one table or figure that describes the finding. Be sure to watch the week six lecture video before you begin. And again, I've included these uh, template files here. So here you just have to do one table or figure. Okay. For your paper, you'll have to do a total of three tables and figures meaning you might have one table, one figure, one table, or figure, figure, figure. Just depends on what your analyses are. Respond to two other students, compare their table or figure to what you learned in week six lecture video, as well as the relevant templates above. Also, please let me know if something is unclear and if possible, suggest a correction. I made a typo, let me fix it. Okay, so that's all for that. What assignments are due Sunday by 11.59 p.m.? So the week week six, part one discussion, which we already went over, the methods of rough draft, 
which we'll go over in a second, the week six part two discussion, you have another quiz and the results rough draft. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. Either my computer's slow or Canvas is slow this morning. Okay. Methods rough draft. All right. Simple, right? You've already done it. You've written your participant section, your procedure section, your measures section. You're just putting them all together. Okay. Go the results rough draft. The results section will consist of one paragraph per hypothesis. For each hypothesis, state the statistical analysis used to assess the hypothesis, provide the appropriate statistical information, as well as an interpretation of the, statis the statistical analysis. Okay, what this is saying is. Follow the templates that we went over and you'll be good. Okay. So again, that should be three paragraphs. And remember, you'll need to find and create article summaries for 10 articles by the end of the term. And remember, this is for your introduction section in part two of your introduction section, specifically your literature review uh, component. Okay, well, that's all I have. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for giving us this opportunity to, to, to meet and, and come to this really pivotal moment in our paper. Lord, give the students uh, the peace and strength that they need to complete uh, these components and patience. Research takes a lot of patience. Lord, all this work we're doing here, Mia's teaching, the students uh, working on, on this paper, Lord, we're doing it for you, for your glory. Be with us as you always are. Give us strength. Help the students realize that it is your will that they are here. And you will give them strength to complete this class because it is your will. Lord, we pray that your will is done in our lives, in the lives of those in our communities, uh, in our state, in our nation, and in the world. Times are very interesting right now. Uh, we just pray for, for, for love and, and, and peace uh, and, and safety. We pray for protection against Satan and his schemes. Lord, for all these intentions and the ones we currently hold in our hearts, uh, we pray to you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Number 6, 24 through 26. And remember, class, this is a peace that surpasses all understanding because it is divine because it comes from God. It comes from Jesus Christ. Give him all your burdens. See through the world, reject the world, and keep your eyes on God. Live according to his will. Seek him first. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. It is no longer you, but Christ who lives within you. Remember these things as you go out into this day, into this coming week. Remember these things as you finish the term. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Okay, so email me if you have any questions. <clears throat> also, I'll have office hours Thursday from 4.30 to 6.30. And as always, I'll send out a link on that day. All right, take care. God bless you.